May God's words alone be spoken. May God's words alone be heard. Amen. Excuse me for a minute, but it's hot up here. Anybody else suffering from the heat? Well, Satan called this morning and he wants his weather back. Hell yeah, let's give it back because this heat is making us all a bit crazy. The thing I don't understand is why everyone is so surprised that summer brings with it a whole lot of heat, particularly after 50 years of scientific warnings that if we keep chipping away at that ozone layer, asbestos underwear may become a summer fashion statement. It is a documented medical fact that prolonged exposure to heat can induce something called heat stress. It can affect our mental state. It causes irritability, aggression, sleep disturbance, and cognitive impairment. How many times this week have you said, where's my keys? I've lost my phone. Much like certain drugs and alcohol, heat stress can amplify certain emotions or character traits that one would not typically display in a less intense environment. I'm sure that you've noticed in many, these many days of 90 plus weather, we've become more grumpy, cranky, we're impatient, and way beyond caring if anybody sees us in the produce aisle at Whole Foods with our heads under the vegetable misters. <laughs> like the Southerners say, this summer has been hotter than a pair of sweatpants filled with barbecue. What does that mean? I don't know, but, I, but it has been a blister out there. And we are made even crankier, edgier, more anxious, because we hold no power to change the weather. Now today's readings, although not about the weather, also reflect on the human condition of feeling powerless in the unco uncontrollable circumstances of life and how we let our emotions get the best of us. First off, one cannot notice that there is a whole lot of dance, dirty dancing going on in both of these testaments. David is boogieing down with his peeps, and Salome is salaciously revving up King Herod's emotional engine. In Samuel, we have King David returning from the wards with God in the box. He is dancing like a wild man, half naked, and jumping and leaping before the servant girls and other ordinary folk in the town. From above, Michael is watching out of her upper window. She is angry to the point of hatred for David. Not because he's hauling God around in the ark, but because he is humiliating the monarchy and he's shaming her by making a spectacle of himself. Dancing with the working people who are a class beneath him is an insult to the house of David. And social decorum mandates that this is no way for a king to behave. Lord knows when he gets home there will be hell to pay. Because what you're not told is that Michael, who is watching and seething, is David's wife. Now this is followed by Mark's story, also about another dancer. Herod's stepdaughter, who is unnamed but known to be Salome, dances seductively and drives that king to distraction. He drunkenly asked this, this, this teenager what would please her. And to please her own mother, Salome becomes the instrument of the death of, of John the baptizer. Give me his head on a platter, Salome asks, and Herod does. Now, Mark is not a typical teaching scripture where Jesus provides a morality par parable for his listeners, but rather details a story about the lives of prominent biblical figures who behave so badly it is hard to imagine. So what does all this biblical dancing and unbridled anger and violence have to do with us? Except to provide a view of the history and culture of the earliest religious ancestors. What strikes me, of course, is that despite the passage of 2,000 years and with all our sophistication, education, and psychological insights, Emotionally, we haven't evolved very much. The use of power to coerce and to manipulate one another is not new news in the realm of human experience or behavior. And it pains me to see two women portrayed in our scripture as powerless, but their experience of being without personal power is not unfamiliar to many women in the present day. 
Michael ultimately does express her outrage to David for his less than kingly behavior. For that, she is punished. David physically abandons his wife, Michael, and denies her the most powerful role for a woman in ancient times. She will never bear children. And then there's Salome, manipulated by her mother, who wants John the Baptist silenced. Herodias uses her maternal power to coerce her daughter to become a murderer. For her part, Salome emerges as a notorious woman whose name is historically synonymous with female immorality. Take notice, my friends, there are very few babies being named Salome. Social power is a predominant theme of the scripture today. There's no mention of the power of God's grace to change human circumstances and no demonstration of Jesus' love to heal a broken people, but just human abuse of power to control the powerless. Well, today I'm not dancing for anyone else, but like Michael, I am looking out my own window and I am feeling angry, angry for my own powerlessness to change what is happening before me. These are the things I see right off that the, the pandemic of gun violence in this country that puts our citizens, our police officers, and now, God help us, a presidential candidate in harm's way. I see our abuse of nature and climate change that results in unprecedented and furious weather events causing devastation and death. Before me are too many children killed in wars in Ukraine and Haiti and Gaza and Somalia. And then there are the laws and promises broken that undermine the autonomy and power of women to make safe decisions about their own health care. I also see the hospitals in Gaza run by the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem, our sister diocese, being closed and wounded, and the wounded displaced, many of which are children. And there's our southern borders, those communities trying so hard to do the best they can to cope, but are overrun by thousands of asylum seekers fleeing violence and poverty in their own countries. And I see all those asylum seekers. They are desperate, they're despondent, and they are displaced. I also see our allies in a world. Take Australia and New Zealand. Do you know they have laws that will not allow the disabled to immigrate to their country? That's despicable. And there's the privatization of the American prison system that is a multi-million dollar business that keeps prisoners in jail longer than they need to. Who benefits from that? And how about yourself? Do you feel powerless when you see our children bullied in schools because they may be different? or when our teens suffer through loneliness, estrangement, and depression as they struggle in a world that only communicates in the third person of social media? How powerless do you feel when you watch our older neighbors who help to grow this community being forced out of their homes because they can't pay the taxes? My point is that once you see the abuse of power, it is hard to unsee all that is broken and beyond our control. Like Michael, anger can become the only avenue to regain our power. And I will say that righteous anger is sometimes okay with me, but left unchecked, it can become toxic to ourselves and to others. So what's to be done? What's to be done with all we can't change because it is beyond our control? and it's under the power of those who don't feel compelled to change. It sounds futile, doesn't it? But my job is not to let you leave here this morning with an empty bucket. I do have something to offer you. It is the power of prayer, a particular prayer, the serenity prayer written by theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. It has been adopted and amended to become the mantra for Alcoholics Anonymous, whose members fully understand that belief in something greater than themselves can bring them power to choose sobriety. The prayer preaches this message. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. 
courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that Jesus will make things right if I surrender to his will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever and ever in the next. Amen. Niebuhr's prayer is an encouragement to us to be brave enough to use our power to change what we can and for what we cannot change, put our trust in Jesus to handle. Now, trusting in Jesus doesn't mean we hand everything over to him and say, you fix this and do a mic drop. That trust calls us together as a community to use our collective power in his name to speak to injustice, to call ourselves and others to account for our own behaviors, to accept our responsibility as a people of God, to never turn our back on those who are powerless and oppressed, and as best we can to provide for the needs of others. Well, you read the scriptures this morning, and you may well say, what, what did speaking to power get Michael? And what power does this one little church have that can change what seems impossible? Will this congregation stop war by sending funds and supplies to the Ukraine and the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem? No. Will we stop the heartbreak and tragedy of millions of asylum seekers at our southern borders by supporting the Lighthouse Mission and the Montclair Hispanic Families Ministry? No. Will hunger and poverty be eradicated by our little pantry on the front lawn? No, again. Will hatred be vanquished by our gay pride flag or our Black Lives Matter flag or the AAP sign is placed at our doors? No. And when we provide financial support to breast cancer groups, are we assuring that all women in this country will have the power to determine their own health care? No. Will meeting our Christian responsibilities as citizens of this country to vote and to speak out and to demand that all our leaders, and when I say all our leaders, I mean all government leaders, political leaders, religious leaders, education leaders, social leaders, all our leaders stop dancing to their own tune and start to take the needs of this country to heart. Do we, sadly? No, 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 and no again. But here is a true thing that does come from our power as God's people. Each time we stand together in God's name, each time we get here on Sunday and stand together, each time we pray together and turn our anger and our frustration or our feelings of powerlessness into holy and good actions for the powerless, then we become so powerful. We become powerful beyond measure. And there's no person or power in God's kingdom that can stop that. Now, there is something we can all dance joyously about. May it always be so. Amen.